Hi, Pastor Steve here. I want to thank you for listening today, and I want to encourage you because I know that God will truly bless you as you study His Word. So hey, let's get started. Crowns, the Lamb upon His 
overcome, you overcome. Every hard thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome, you overcome. At the cross, the work was finished. You were buried in the ground. The grave could not contain you, for you wear the victor's crown.
Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Many years ago, I heard a sermon from a biblical scholar who is significantly smarter than me. His main theme was this. Orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. Let me start by admitting I did not know what he meant. But he did a good job of explaining, and I'm going to try to do the same thing this morning. The definition of orthodoxy. It's a compound Greek word that means with ortho, meaning straight, right, or correct, and doxy, meaning knowledge, truth, or wisdom. Many have termed this correct doctrine. The definition of orthopraxy, again, is a compound Greek word with ortho, meaning straight, right, or correct, and praxi, meaning practice or behavior. So more simply, orthopraxy is correct behavior or right living. So let's review the, the statement again. Orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. Correct teaching or knowledge of doctrine leads to correct behavior. Again, having an an accurate or appropriate understanding of how we relate to God directs how we will respond to him. We will only respond to God correctly when we understand what it is that he has done for us. And this is critical. And the miracle of Easter gives us an opportunity to review what it is that he has done for us. I'm going to read Romans 3, 22 to 25. I normally read out of the American, New American Standard or the English um, Standard, but my, I had a Lent devotion that put me in the New Living Translation, and so I'm going to read out of that. Verse 22 of Romans 3. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Our, for God pre presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. When we truly see and deeply understand the truth found in verse 23, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, then we begin to see our desperate need for a Savior. We cannot be made right 
with God by anything that we can do on our own. We are hopeless to find true life. We are lost and actually vile because of our sins, which separate us from a holy and unique God. Verse 24 says this, Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. It is only by God's grace, which is freely offered to you and to me, that we can be saved from our sin. Although we don't deserve it, God sent his son to die in our place. The second half of verse 24 says this, He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. What we deserved because of our sin was not freedom. But Jesus chose to take our place of condemnation so that we could, be, we could be made right before God. Verse 25, God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. It was not Jesus' sin that put him on the cross, but yours and mine. And it required a sacrifice. But Jesus paid a price that he didn't owe. So here's our starting point. This is orthodoxy. This is the correct understanding of who we are in relationship to God. God so loved us that he sent his only son to die and to reconcile us. But we cannot stop with only, only with this orthodoxy. We cannot remain with an, with an intellectual understanding of God's redemptive act. We must progress to right behavior or orthopraxy. This is reflected in the second half of verse 25. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. When we believe the truth of Jesus' love, it must change us to be different. We, if we understand the meaning of Jesus' shed blood, we will only be amazed at his goodness and his grace. The amazing love causes us to overflow with his love as well. Does your orthopraxy overflow with the love of Jesus? Many in our country have an intellectual understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, but, but it doesn't cause a change in their hearts or in their actions. One reminder the devil understood very clearly who Jesus is and what he did. But his actions are not orthopraxy. My challenge today, are we, are you, am I, living with both orthodoxy and orthopraxy? I want to end with re reading the first verse that we read this morning again. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. Here at Lawrence Heights, we practice open communion. This means that the only requirement um, is that during, to join us during this time of communion is that you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Servers will present a tray to you soon. Each stack contains two cups. With the bread in the bottom, and the juice in the top cup. Please know that, that extreme care has been taken in preparation of these elements. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with a sense of awe at your love and your goodness. How amazing it is that we can know that we are free today because of an empty grave over 2,000 years ago. This gift of salvation is offered to us only because of your great mercy and grace. We thank you and praise you for saving us. Help us to see our desperate need for both orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Use us to show your love to the rest of this city, this state, this country, this world. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty grave. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen.
Would you please stand? The moon and stars they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. One final breath he gave. As heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell for man broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away. Could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Now, forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Our appreciation once again for our praise team leading us in worship today. Amen. Once again, good morning to you, church family. Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Empty Tomb. Amen. 
Today is an epic celebration of the greatest moment in the history of the world, and I want to welcome each and every one of you and thank you for celebrating here with us, whether you're here in the room or following along online. We're just delighted that you're here. If you happen to be new around here, maybe even checking us out for the very first time, you need to know that what we experience here in worship and the teaching of God's Word, the life change that we see in the gospel, we experience that here every single Sunday. So if you don't happen to have a church home of your own, we want to invite you to plug right in and connect. In fact, one of the easiest ways you can connect can be found inside your bulletin. Hopefully you've got one of these on your way in here today. This is your weekly connection to so many of the things going on here at the church, like Bible studies, outreach opportunities, fellowship activities as well. For those of you who are regulars, we want to make sure that you know that, that the food and product drive out there in the foyer that you see to bless Alpha Christian Children's Homes. Got one more week after today uh, that we can gather those items and send to that very special ministry partner of ours. Also, inside, please find that little tear-off connections card there on the side. We'd love to know that you are here today and how we can best meet your ministry needs or encourage you or partner with you in prayer. And then for your convenience, you can just tear it right out and you can leave it back there in the offering box back in the back on your way out. Now, for our time of Bible study today, we're going to be camped out in Mark chapter 16, there on the New Testament side of your Bible. That's where we're going to be reading this first account of Resurrection Day. So if you've got your Bible nearby or your mobile device, go ahead and open up to Mark 16. Mark is the second book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Once you've found that starting spot with God's Word open before us, what do you say we go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask Him to bless our time of study here today? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we say thank you. Thank you for the promise of your son and the power that raised him from the dead that now lives in us. So today as we look back at the most important historical moment in the history of the world, please help us to see that event not just in the past, but also right here in this present moment on Easter of 2022. Lord, use this message, use this reality to change us and to change our eternal destination to help us overcome the obstacles that we face in our life, and to fill our hearts with faith. Lord, we pray that you would do this and a whole lot more here today in Jesus' name. And all together in unity, the church said, Amen. 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 Well, looking back, I think if we're honest, for most of us, the past two years have perhaps been some of the most difficult years of our lives. I mean, the entire world shut down. So many of our rhythms and patterns of life were just totally interrupted. For many of us, our eyes have seen things that we never thought we'd see, or we lost things that we never thought we'd lose. Some of you, either you directly or somebody you know, you lost jobs. Some have lost businesses. Some lost their savings account. Some have lost their health. Some have lost a friend or a family member. And you're left with this deep sense, this question, how do you possibly come back from a time like that? Well, listen, that's why Easter 2022 is so very important. Today, we celebrate the resurrection that came after the worst night in all of human history, Good Friday. And through that Friday and Saturday, people wondered even back then, is there a way to come back from this? And the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest comeback of all time. And as we read through it today, I hope it forces us to ask the question, hey, if Jesus had his comeback, I wonder, is there a comeback for me? My friend, listen, the answer is yes, there is. Because if we're in Christ, you and me, then we get to share in his victory. And that's great news for us here today. Amen? Amen. We can thank him for bringing us along in his victory. But Mark chapter 16, verse 1 begins this way. Please follow along as we read it together. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? So what's happening here? Well, here we see the only record of what happened on the Saturday between Good Friday and Sunday. At the end of the Jewish Sabbath, these women went on Saturday night and they bought spices because the next morning, very early in the morning, they were going to go and they were going to anoint the body of Jesus. 
Now think that through. They're not going to the tomb to witness a resurrection. No, they're going to the tomb with signs of defeat in their hands. The spices to anoint the very body of the man who knew them better than anybody else. The man who loved them and showed them the way that the kingdom of God worked. The man who forgave them and healed them. But now, now they're going to remember his defeat, which was his death. And you can almost sense the shock and the disorientation. Because as they're walking to the tomb, they haven't even thought about the fact that there's a great big stone that the three of them together don't have the strength to roll away. And if you think about it, that's exactly what happens when you're in shock. You don't think about some of the basic logical things that you've got to do. And so as they're walking very early in the morning, while it's still dark, they start to wonder, how in the world are we going to roll that stone away? Again, that stone was huge, way bigger than they could move. And that right there, that should cause us to ask some reflective questions here on Easter of 2022. And one of those questions is, is there a stone in my own life that I just can't move? Is there a stone in your life that you can't move? It's this obstacle, it's imposing, it's intimidating. Maybe it even taunts you. There's no way around it. There's no way through it. And you, by yourself, you don't have the strength to move it. Maybe for you, that stone is fear. Maybe fear has really gripped you this past year. Or maybe for you, it's some offense Somebody's hurt you, and you still feel the bitterness rise up every time you hear their name or you see their face, and you're like, God, please, could you just move this stone for me? Or maybe for you, this symbol of defeat, this symbol of finality, or the divorce papers you were served, or the bankruptcy filing, or the scholarship that you lost, or the injury that you suffered. Listen, there's just these things that come into our lives that they're just, they're obstacles, things that we can't move. And these women who are walking, remember, they've been grieving for two days now. This is the third day, and their heads are down. It's dark. They're just wallowing in the helplessness and the despair and the pain. But then take a look at verse 4. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Of course they were. They certainly didn't expect to see the stone rolled away and no body in the tomb, and then also this angel there. So it's understandable why they're trying to process all that has taken place. But I want you to notice that the very first thing that they had to do as they're trying to process the miracle that just happened, did you catch it there in Scripture? They had to look up. They had to look up. You see, honestly, I think of the past two years for us, we spent too much time looking down into the darkness, glued to our mobile devices and our cell phones. Oh, no, no, look what what happened in the news. Oh, no, look what happened with the election. Oh, no, look what happened with the pandemic. Look at all the division and the loss of trust. Oh, now, look, somebody else has been canceled here today. And it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Now, honestly, friend, I think if we would just put our phones down and look up, imagine how different our perspective would be. Amen? Amen. These women, they're walking in the dark. They're cloaked in despair until they look up and they see the stone has been moved and they see this angelic figure. Isn't it interesting how defeat seems so final until it isn't? Now look at verse 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now this was a total freak out moment. They go from despair to now bewilderment and alarm. What in the world is going on? They just run out of the tomb. The angel told them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He told you that before. And he's gone already ahead of you to prepare things for you, to see you. In other words, Jesus has already made his comeback, and he's working his comeback plan. Listen, you need to understand that 
even here today, friend, Jesus is already ahead of you. And he's already working on your comeback plan. Because if God raised Jesus from the dead, again, we get to share in that victory, the resurrected life. But of course, these women are struggling to understand and to process all of this. And actually, in our time here this morning, I just want to have a real honest conversation about this. Like when you read this account, some of you here in the room or online, you might be wondering, is, is, that, is that real? Is this for real? Is it true? Or is it just one of those stories that Christians read once a year at Easter time in order to try to make themselves feel better? Or has it become this kind of a verbal crutch to use whenever things don't work out all that well for you? And Christians will just say that they're just going to trust in God. Or maybe it's the hope of heaven that just gets people through. Honestly, some of you might think that this is a made-up story. And friend, if that describes you here today, I would encourage you to just follow your doubts. Go ahead and look at the history of the fact that there have been many religious leaders in our world over the years. But make no mistake, none of them filled as many prophecies as Jesus did. None of them claimed to be from God. And absolutely none of them, not one at all, had an empty tomb. In fact, you can visit the graves of all those other religious leaders at any time, but there's something about an empty tomb. Amen? I mean, just stop and think about the icon of the Christian faith. We always look to the cross, don't we? But 2,000 years ago, crosses were really common. People were dying on crosses every single day. There's nothing exceptional about a cross. But listen, there weren't any other empty tombs. Do you understand what I'm saying? There was only one who came back from the dead. And so the historical moment of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the pinnacle of our faith. Yes, Jesus paid our debt on the cross, but because he rose from the dead, he broke the power of death. The Apostle Paul said that if Jesus has not risen, then not only are we still dead in our sins, but our entire faith is in vain. He said if Jesus has not risen, then we are to be pitied more than anybody else in the world. But, my friend, if Jesus is alive, then that totally changes everything. And since that moment in time, people have bet their eternity on whether or not they believe in this account. So friend, if you're here today and you have doubts, I just want to tell you that you're in really good company because the response to the resurrection by the early disciples was the very same. They doubted and they feared, even though they saw him face to face, even though he told them how the comeback was going to happen. Remember, he said, if you destroy this temple, it's going to be raised again in three days. He also said, like Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, the Son of Man will be raised up on the third day. And he said, I'm going to suffer and die, but on the third day, I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to go before you. Jesus told them face to face how he was going to fulfill prophecy and how it was all going to happen, but they still didn't believe. So if you're struggling with doubts here today, I just want you to know that Jesus is so patient with you in those moments. Friend, aren't you grateful for the patience of God waiting for us to pursue our questions and then to follow his path? I know I am. Now stop and think about the feelings that the gospel writers were experiencing then. Like confusion, shock, euphoria, doubt, joy, and amazement, all of which were set against the horrible backdrop of Good Friday and then the powerful comeback of Easter Sunday. Both of those two things have a lot of the same emotions. Some of the worst moments and some of the best moments in life bring out a lot of the same emotions. Let me just stop and think about some of the greatest epic comebacks of all time. Some of you here today aren't old enough to remember, but I can certainly remember this epic comeback in 1980. It was the U.S. hockey team in the Olympics. They were a group of amateurs who were facing the best hockey team in the history of the world, the Soviet Union who'd won four consecutive gold medals, dominating the sport for the previous 16 years. Nobody thought in a million years that this U.S. team could beat the Soviets. And sure enough, wouldn't you know it, in the third period, the U.S. was down. Everybody thought, well, of course, this is it. I mean, there's no way they can come back from that, except they did. It's called the miracle on ice. Movies have been made about it. I think one of the coolest things is watching the clip and seeing the players' faces after the comeback. It's total disbelief. 
They don't even know where to look. They don't know what to do with their hands. They just start circling around on their skates and jumping up and down, hugging everybody because they could not believe that they had just beaten the unbeatable team. Now, that's the power and euphoria of the comeback. And here in Lawrence, Kansas, we know a thing or two about epic comebacks, do we not? (laughs) Just two weeks ago, the Kansas Jayhawks mounted the greatest comeback in NCAA championship history. Now, I don't know about you, but there you go. That gets an amen. I don't know about you, but at halftime, I'm confessing, I was totally convinced that it was over. There was absolutely no way that they could come back from that. It had never been done before. My wife, on the other hand, Kelly, she was dressed and ready to go downtown to celebrate the victory. (laughs) At halftime, she was ready to go. And she said with complete confidence, they're going to win this game. But oh me of little faith. (laughs) She never doubted, not for a moment. And sure enough, she was right. For you Chiefs fans here in the room, Patrick Mahomes has taught us a few things about epic comebacks, has he not? Not the least of which was the 2020 Super Bowl. Down double digits midway through the fourth quarter, Patrick Mahomes leads an epic comeback to defeat the 49ers. Now listen, what makes a comeback so good is when the middle is so bad. Now maybe you're here today and you're not a sports fan. So maybe you've heard of a man named Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was sentenced to prison for life. He was actually taken on a ferry to a prison on Robben Island, and he was told that this is where he would die. But after 27 years of being in prison, he was released and went on to become the president of South Africa. He created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and helped dismantle apartheid in South Africa. He even won the Nobel Peace Prize and is still celebrated today as the father of South Africa. Now that is an epic comeback, if you ask me, right? We love to celebrate Epic comebacks. Or maybe, maybe you've heard about this little computer company called Apple. What you may not know is that back in 1996, they were 90 days away from bankruptcy until they hired some guy. I think his name was Steve. Steve Jobs. And in 2018, they became the first trillion-dollar company in the United States. And many of you, right now, this very moment, you're holding their comeback in your hands. For others of you Android users, I'm just so sorry for you. I, I know, yeah, yeah. Listen, the point is this. Epic comebacks are all around us if we'll just open up our eyes. Friend, if you'll just lift up your head and look up, God has an epic comeback for you today. Amen? Seriously, Steve, are you saying that God has a comeback for me today? I think the answer in the Bible is clear that he does. God is at work in powerful ways all around us if we'll just lift up our heads and look. When you think about the power of the resurrection, it invades every broken space where you're wondering what if or how. How could God possibly fix this? But you know what? With all the comebacks that we've listed today, if you know the end of the story, it makes the middle so much different. Listen, I've re-watched the Chiefs Super Bowl victory a dozen times at least by now, and I've, I giggle every single time I watch. And I can't wait to re-watch the KU game. I promise I'm going to feel totally different now than I did back on that night. I won't even yell at the TV even one time this, this time. <laughs> but listen carefully. If you're a Christian, then you know we're going to a place called heaven because of the grace of God. And Jesus is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He's going to take away sin and death and all those things that bring us fear and pain. And he's going to make all things new. The Bible describes death as being swallowed up in victory. This is our future destination because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Listen, church, we know how this game ends. The angel said to the women, Jesus has risen. He's gone ahead of you. And honestly, I think that's a specific word for somebody here today. Friend, listen. Jesus has already gone ahead of you. So if you've experienced some setback in life, you need to understand that a setback is a prerequisite for a comeback. It's precisely in this moment where you need to know that he's already ahead of you. He's already working out a good plan, which is exactly what God loves to do. 
Again, he's already ahead of you, so don't ever underestimate what Jesus is up to in your life, even in the most difficult times and seasons that you experience. Even now, here in this room, Jesus is speaking comeback stories over people's lives. Now, I promise some of you are going to be pinching yourselves a year from now because you're going to be totally blown away by what Jesus has done between today and then. The only question is, are you asking for it? Are you expecting him to make those breakthroughs in your life? Because that's exactly how we should be praying. Jesus himself said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. This is an invitation for us to press into this relationship with Jesus. When the disciples first witnessed this, just like when you witness any comeback, again, at first there's doubt. Then there's this incredible sense of excitement and joy And now everywhere they went, they were telling people. The women told the disciples, the disciples told other disciples, and it just continued. And now the good news and the early church, that's how it spread. And today, 2,000 years later, people's lives are still being transformed because they're continuing to tell the story. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Because of the power of Jesus Christ in my life, I too have an epic comeback. Frankly, this is something we should be celebrating because this room I know is full of those kinds of comeback stories. Amen? Amen. Speaking of comebacks, how many of you know that Jesus is going to come back again? And when he comes back, the Bible describes him on a white horse with the armies of heaven behind him. And on his thigh is written the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So in the end, we are victorious because we are with him. Amen? Amen? Gives us another reason to celebrate here in 2022, the goodness of our God. So again, knowing the end of the story helps you in the middle. Here's how John put it, Jesus' best friend. In 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, he said, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. That is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. John's talking about the middle here. He's saying between this moment and when Jesus returns, we walk by faith. That's the victory. I already told you how much I love watching the replay of the Chiefs Super Bowl victory or how I can't wait to watch the KU championship again. Because when you know who wins in the end, then all the ebbs and flows of the game really don't matter that much. No matter how bad it gets, you already know who wins in the end. Listen, that's exactly what the Christian faith is. Because we know who wins in the end. And today we want to celebrate the fact that we have the victory because Jesus has given it to us as his people. That's an inheritance that nothing or nobody can ever take from us. Amen? Amen. And now it's our chance to respond. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Or maybe you've been coming to church for a long, long time, but yet you're still far away wondering, how do I get back? Well, listen, Jesus loved to tell comeback stories. In fact, his most well-known comeback story is a story that many of you know very well. It's the prodigal son. I'm sure you've heard of it before. Jesus said that there was this father. He had two sons. And at some point, the youngest son says to his father, Dad, give me my inheritance. I want my money right now. It's almost like he was saying, I don't want you, dad. I just want your stuff. But yet the father goes ahead and gives the son his inheritance. He takes all that money and he goes to a faraway land where he parties and he spends every last penny. And of course, he he had lots of friends. It is until, of course, the money was all gone. Then the so-called friends disappear and now he's all alone. But then things get even worse. A famine hits. So now he's starving to death, and the only job that he could find is feeding pigs on a farm. And he's so hungry that while he's feeding the pigs, he starts eating the husks just to survive. And Jesus said that that right there, that's where he came to his senses and started to think, you know what, even if I was just a lowly servant in my father's house, at least I'd have food to eat. And he began to think, maybe, maybe I should come back home. And he starts that journey. I'm sure with every single step, there was a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, a lot of regret. Man, what was I thinking? 
Why? Why didn't I listen to any of my father's warnings? Instead, I just, I thought I knew it all. Just the embarrassment of thinking, I don't even know if I can look my dad in the eye. He had this speech all prepared. I'm sure he'd rehearsed it over and over again. Father, please forgive me. Father, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. I just want to be your humble servant if you'll just have me back. But then Jesus says that while the son was walking home, the father saw him coming from a long ways away and the father began to run toward his son. Now, friend, you can read the Bible from cover to cover, but you're never going to see God the Father running except here in this story. God doesn't run from anyone or anything, but he is quick to run towards somebody who's repenting, somebody who's acknowledging the fact that they've made a mess and they need forgiveness, somebody who needs a second chance, somebody who needs a comeback. And as Jesus continues the story and describes the Father running to his son, In my mind, I imagine this huge bear hug. And as the son starts his speech, the father interrupts, no, 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 listen, we're going to kill the fattened calf. We're going to put the royal robe on you. We're going to give you new shoes. I'm going to throw this huge party because my son who was lost is now found. My son who is dead is now alive. Listen, there was a great party. That party can happen again today because we have a number of comeback stories right here in the room as well. Some of you are far away from God. Some of you have struggled to believe in Jesus maybe your whole life. Maybe you prayed a prayer to Jesus when you were little, but then since then you've just wandered all over the place. Friend, Jesus wants to change your life today. He wants you to experience a comeback that's epic in every proportion. And I want to challenge you to try to make this Easter, Easter 2022, the most epic Easter of your entire life. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer together. Father God, as we bow before you now in your very presence, we're acutely aware of the scandal of grace because all of us are sinners. Every single one of us have offended you. We've rebelled and tried to do our own thing, and yet you pour out your grace on us. It's such an undeserved gift. Jesus says that even if one sinner repents, there's a great celebration in all of heaven. So Father, I pray for that person who's ready to repent of their sins and to place their faith and their hope and their trust in Jesus. Lord, I want them to experience the power of resurrection. Please give them the courage to step forward and experience this miracle for themselves. Or much in the same way, if somebody has wandered from you, Lord, please give them the strength and the courage to return and draw near. Remind them that you already see them and you're already running in their direction even as we speak, ready to lavish them with grace and mercy and healing and restoration. Just like you transformed the cross, the symbol of the death of all hope, and you turned it into the symbol of hope for all generations, Lord, we know you can do the very same thing in our lives and in our church right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you want to start a relationship with the God who knows you and loves you better than you know and love yourself, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and walk forward. Together, we're going to pray in repentance and in surrender. Together, we're going to ask for forgiveness and to commit to following Jesus in every area of our lives. Remember, the very very same power that raised Christ from the dead can now live in you, the very Holy Spirit of God. That's why this Easter could be the most epic Easter of your entire life. The Bible says, repent and be baptized. Today is the day of salvation. Or maybe you, maybe you're that prodigal that just needs to return. Friend, here's your opportunity. This is your personal invitation. Really, for any need you might have here today, please come forward as we all stand and sing together now.
Thanks again for listening today. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like more information about our church or if you just want to share what God's been doing in your life, drop us a line. Give us a call. Again, may God bless you.